All right, I am back for a Diablo 4 video, the big Diablo 4 video, uh, which is joining the review I just published because embargo is up today. Uh, long review. I really hope you guys go read it. I will put a link in the description here. I spent a while on it, and yet somehow I still managed to call my necromancer a warlock in the first line. So I'm doing great. Um, anyway, I gave the game a 9 out of 10. It seems to be that the average scores are going to be somewhere around an 88, 89 on Metacritic. That is very good. <laughs> uh, anything above an 85 is generally considered a, a big win for a company. It just sucks a little bit for Blizzard today that Street Fighter came out with a 92. Um, I thought it would probably be around an 85 to a 90. And here we are. It does seem like it's going to uh, land around that. Very good scores, uh, especially for Blizzard, which badly needed a win after not releasing anything for an extremely long time, uh, killing off a lot of their past games, their kind of glory day games, and launching Overwatch 2 in the dumbest way imaginable. But I am happy to report that Diablo 4 is very good. Uh, you may have gotten a taste of that during the two betas in the server slam, which was a significant amount of content. Um, in terms of what I did, I, I even restrained myself a little bit because... All of our characters are being wiped, all of our progress is being wiped, and I can only break my heart uh, so much to put so much time in. I mean, I, I don't have the extra time to put into something that's going to be deleted, and as much as I play, which is probably like 30, 35 hours um, on Necromancer, I beat the whole campaign, I got to the end game. I played all the end game activities, I did a, a functional build, I, I feel like I got a good amount out of it, enough to render a verdict. I just saw Travis from IGN. Uh, got to 71 on his main class and put, um, you get to level 30 on every other class. I very much respect that. I did not have time to do anything remotely that deep. And yet, sure enough, we both gave it a 9. So um, I do stand by my early judgment here. Obviously, if you really, really want to play, uh, you know, and know everything about Diablo, that's going to be, what, 100 hours easily to take a bunch of classes to max and, you know, do all the end game stuff. Um, I'll try to go sort of in order here. So uh, I did Necromancer. The reason I did Necromancer is because I already did Druid and Rogue in the betas. And I'm going to start with Barbarian on my main no progress deleted playthrough, which begins Thursday night, but given server issues, probably Friday, if I had to guess. Uh, I'm not really a Necro person in general. Like um, I've, I've played it. I've played all the you know, Necro classes and past Diablo games at some point. It's just not really one of my main classes. Um, you played Act 1 in the, the beta, but uh, things expand dramatically into six acts from there. I cannot go into specific story content uh, about those acts, which I don't think you'd want to know anyway necessarily, but I can give you kind of the broad strokes of the campaign, which, as much as I like the Diablo games in general... I have not really cared about the story of these games. I do not think the stories have been effectively very good <laughs> for the most part. I remember in Diablo 3 when Deckard Cain died by this little butterfly demon that wasn't even in a cutscene. I'm like, this is this is just goofy. Like, I, I don't think storytelling has been one of Diablo's strong suits as much as I enjoy the series. This time the storytelling is good. It's very good. Uh, I don't know exactly what sort of overhaul they... they did for this and why they were able to extract a very solid story out of this, but they did. Um, I think two key reasons this works is because of Lorath. Lorath is voiced by uh, Ralph Innocent, I think that's his name, shoot. And uh, he's an actor you would probably recognize. Uh, I know him probably best from The Witch, where he's like the Puritan father. You'll recognize his voice. Uh, I would say he is more compelling and interesting than Deckard Cain, as he's sort of the narrator for the entire thing. Your character is voiced, but you don't say a lot. Uh, and then obviously the other uh, main contributor to this is Lilith. Lilith is a, it's both a is fantastically voice acted character, but also a really compelling villain in the sense where it's not just like, I'm this big evil lord and I'm going to, you know, kill everyone. Like, it's a little more complex than that. Uh, Lilith is Mephisto's daughter. And um, she's like, not, you know, the biggest of big bads, but uh, she is very compelling in the sense that it's not just that she's like going to murder everyone. I mean, she is murdering a lot of people, but uh, she's created this sort of cult around her. And you, you saw that in the beta with some of the early 
beta cutscenes where there's like a priest he gets murdered to death by Lilith's followers and you just, you keep running into enclaves of like very brainwashed Lilith, follow, Lilith followers you'll be betrayed many times by people you think are helping you that are Lilith followers they're everywhere uh, and then Lilith herself her relationship with Anarius uh, the, her relationship with the other main characters in Diablo history um, very very good I, I think she is the strongest villain this series has ever had frankly uh, the campaign is, is six acts. Act three is really long. Act five and six are, are kind of short, so I thought they were one act, and then the game was over. So I, the, the length is a little weird. Um, as we know, this is like a big open world map now. It's not these little instances. We're going to the jungle zone, the forest zone, and like there are different terrains, certainly, but it's all on one big map. And if you kind of follow the direct path of the storyline it will carve you, you know, a certain ways through the map. By the end, I would say you've probably explored no more than 40 to 50% of the map if you just followed the campaign and didn't really just go out of your way to explore. Uh, I really kind of like this exploration idea. Um, I did not 100% the map because I wanted there to be some mysteries at launch here, but the stuff I did find, especially in the end game, uh, you really start trying to explore. Uh, they've, they've gone over all this in-game stuff, so it's not really um, spoilers per se. It's just like the PvP feels of hate. Like that's not something it necessarily like puts a giant flashing arrow over. It's like you explore and eventually you will run into the fields of hate and then you will kind of get an introduction to it. Um, the same thing will end up happening with uh, the Helltides. Helltides is a interesting area where like a certain zone of the map is going to be um, roasted, and then you will go there and kill enemies that are very hard. <laughs> the enemies I was fighting with were five over power for me. And uh, you will collect a temporary currency that you will need to spend on chests when time runs out, and those chests give you really good loot. It's sacred legendaries, which are like upgraded legendaries with better stats. I think that's what they are. Uh, and then there is essentially adventure mode, also again, given to you by this evil tree that tells you to do tr tasks for the evil tree. It's, it's kind of like, it, it's giving you a reason to do all the various things on the map, like do this cellar, you know, kill this boss, run this dungeon, and then those add up to like certain points you take back to the tree, and then he'll give you a cache, which might contain legendaries. And then there are, of course, dungeons. You experience dungeons um, in the beta itself. Those are permanent unlock aspects that go across all classes and all characters. Those are, are count-bound unlocks. So you can unlock them everywhere, as are the Shrines of Lilith that are permanent stat boosts that you will find all over the map, as are the uh, exploration bonuses you will find as you do side quests and find things on the map which give you skill points uh, across all your classes too. So there is a lot of kind of account bound stuff where it feels like you will get a good amount of bonuses if you switch over characters and you've gone really hard on one. Um, uh, there is a Capstone Dungeon which I played the whole game in World Tier 2. And that is essentially the max you can do, uh, at least for your first run, unless they change something at launch. And then once you do that, and once you hit, I think it's once you hit 50, which is like the soft cap, I, I would say by that point, you've unlocked all your skill points. That is around the power level when the end game, when the campaign ends and the the, uh, the end game begins. You could get there earlier if you just kind of speed run it and don't really get that much XP from side stuff. But you will <clears throat> then have to do a capstone dungeon, which is a really long dungeon kind of at your power level, or like at 50, I think. And then if you beat that, you can graduate to um, World Tier 3, and that's when sacred legendary items are dropping. That's when all these other end game mechanics unlock. And like the game gets harder, certainly, uh, but you will be able to quickly kind of gear up and get better stuff than what you've been using in the campaign. Um, in terms of overall difficulty, Necromancer at times kind of felt like cheating because I would just I, I got all these legendaries where it was just like raising extra skeletons so I had like seven warrior skeletons and like five mage skeletons and a giant golem so most of my um, fighting was having my skeletons box all the enemies out blowing up corpses so they created these black damage over time pools under enemies and then throwing blood lances uh, from a distance at the enemies this worked for normal enemies, this worked uh, for bosses. I specced totally into all minion stuff, all minion health and damage. And they still were getting killed <laughs> uh, a lot. But the thing is, is like, anytime there's a corpse around, you can raise another skeleton. I had a skeleton that creates a corpse 15% of the time on hit. You have seven of those skeletons, it is a large, large number of corpses that 
you, you can't really even there's no mana cost on summoning skeletons or co corpse explosion so you're just it's spam 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 and, and it's it was really easy to kind of maintain my skeleton army a couple of the bosses gave me a little bit of trouble but generally speaking um it, it went pretty well and then i was able to form a very coherent build i would say by the end uh and even the kind of limited amount of legendaries you have access to before you really get into the end game uh the gearing system and the skill system is interesting so i wasn't really sure how i felt about this idea that legendaries would now have these sort of interchangeable affixes because before all legendaries were like these are the boots that do this thing this is the helmet that does this thing and then you would mix and match them but th this is kind of the philosophy that blizzard is going for here where they want you to have a lot more options in order to build out your character and what that means in practice is that it, it in some ways it's a lot less farming time because you're not you don't need to farm the one specific helmet with the one specific you know perk with the one specific stat roll if you get something else that has the legendary perk you want and it's not good, you dismantle it and you put it on something else. So the way this worked was I got, I don't know, several dozen legendaries, probably like 40 legendaries by the time the campaign ended. And you can take old ones and put the underleveled ones into new things. So this very easily allowed me by the end to create this big minion based uh, build with a lot of like minion based affixes, um, you know, dramatically increase skeleton damage and then some upgrades for my blood lance things like that and that was like that was a good amount of play time but like it feels like that was a build that probably would have taken me a lot longer to assemble in like just like just the campaign of like diablo 3 like i feel like the campaign of diablo 3 like you come out of that and you're half dressed in like you know yellow items still it's it's a lot different than that but then there are obviously there are going to be levels beyond this there are sacred legendaries which are upgraded version of current legendaries and then there are unique items which do not have interchangeable affixes my whole time, I got one. I got one unique item, and that was uh, from beating the campaign, which I think is a guaranteed drop. Uh, I won't say what that is, lest it be a spoiler, but um, those are going to be farmed more at higher tiers. The skill system is is interesting. I think there's some pros and cons to the skill system. Um, it is this tree that goes zigzagging down the way, and it is no longer like if you put a point in something and then you regret that later, you have to restart your entire character which is what diablo 2 was which i really really hated that i thought that was a very stupid decision uh diablo 3 was the opposite respect anything anytime move runes around whatever here it's a little it's it's a mix of both i'd say it's closer to diablo 3 but if you want to change your your core skills you kind of have to delete your skill points to go all the way back to whatever skill you want to change it's it's to give it like some level of cost but it's kind of annoying if you just want to change like your primary attack, which is your first node, and you have to go all the way back up there. But if you have an individual skill and then you upgrade like two little nodes for it, you just have to like subtract a skill point and then go to the other node. And like it has a cost, but you don't have to go like all the way back up the skill tree, which I did not learn until like 20 hours into the game. Um, it The costs increase as time goes on, but at least so far, I haven't found them to be too oppressive like gold is pretty plentiful if you're doing it all the time and like you're dramatically changing builds all the time yeah i could see it being annoying um i kind of wish there was just loadouts and there wasn't this cost attached like i just don't really see the, the benefit of it um i when i interviewed diablo uh devs they said that like the goal was not to get people to make multiple characters of the same class that you build the goal was just to make respecking affordable enough where people could respect if they wanted to and other stuff and I don't know. I, I have to see how that plays out in the longer term. But um, the skills themselves, I, I find are really interesting. Uh, one thing I was talking about with skill up before this was it's kind of weird that they make ultimates like take up one of your skill slots. I know they kind of did this in Diablo 3, but a character ultimate feels like it should be a separate thing. And the cooldowns are so high on those usually that it just it feels like it's a slot it shouldn't be taking up. Because, you you know, otherwise you're spamming all these skills, like, at most every 10, 15 seconds, at least every 1 to 2 seconds. And then you have this, like, 45 second, 60 second ultimate cooldown. Again, maybe over time it will uh, be less oppressive. You get items to reduce that cooldown, stuff like that. Um, but that was just sort of a, a weird decision there. Uh, in terms of Necro specifically, my only real complaint with Necro was when you spam these corpse death pools it like blacks out the screen like to like the, wherever it's it is to a point where you can't see the enemies you can't see your skeleton if you're 
if you're standing in it, you can't see yourself. It is like pitch black. And like, I don't quite know why it did that. Uh, so corpse explosion might be better, but I really like the damage over time and I had some upgrades for that. So just sort of a weird uh, necro quirk there. Um, in terms of kind of other end game stuff and other skill stuff, I am really, really interested in uh, the Paragon board system, which, you know, everyone knows the Paragon system in Diablo 3, you overlevel, you get plus a bunch of stats. <laughs> Essentially, it's it's just a, a large amount of, of stats that add up over time and give you bonuses. Those apply to your other characters. You can kind of blaze through things faster. Now you can just skip the campaign if you want, so there's no real reason to uh, hyper rush your characters in the same way through the campaign. But um, here it's interesting because there are some pretty powerful nodes that even even early on you can access like a, a couple paragon points in i got uh, a node that was like just a flat 10 percent damage increase just playing the game like even as you go through the level bar like 50 to 51 i think gets you like three or four paragon points just going from there so it's not one level one paragon point so you're going to be getting a ton of paragon points and uh, the goal eventually is to lead these up into um a legendary node on each board and a legendary node is like a very very strong kind of unique legendary ability like there were a couple that like would crazily boost my my minion builds uh above and beyond anything i'd had before and like i didn't grind hard enough to get to one of those yet but there are like a, a grand total of a bunch of different tiles so once you finish that tile you connect the next one where you're going to want to get to the legendary one and the next one and this seems like a very, very long-term project. There's a rune system somehow built into there that I didn't quite grasp by the time, uh, you know, I, I reached the end of my playtime. But the, the point is it is a very, very more uh, elaborate system than what we had in Diablo 3 with the Paragon system. And, like, what we see in games like Borderlands with these just, you know, 0.03 reload speed every point you put in. Like, it is, it's a lot more than that. Um, in terms of things that were maybe lacking, I talked about this in my review, uh, enemy diversity is not amazing so far, and, like, I get that you want to reprise enemies, but, like, it's a lot of reprised enemies, and, like, I don't know how many times I can fight Goatman and still have that be interesting. There are some new ones, like the, you probably saw in the beta, the, the corpse guy who gets infected by a spider, and then you kill him, and the spider comes out. Uh, I don't know if Diablo kind of a arachnophobia mode because of that, but, um, <laughs> There are definitely some new ones. The boss design is different. There's a lot of new bosses. There's some old bosses also, but boss design has certainly changed uh, a good amount. But I, I know they've said that they're, they're, they're going to be introducing new enemies as the seasons go on. So I do sort of wonder what may have been held back in favor of live service stuff if they want to be adding new enemy types per season. Um, there are many, many instances where the environments look absolutely gorgeous with, you know, graphics that are no longer 12 years old or whenever Diablo came out. Uh, some of the areas, like some of the more open landscapes can feel a bit a bit muddy and drab, like they're going a little too hard on this like Diablo 2 brown aesthetic, but that's probably compensated by the detail that goes into a lot of the other areas. Um, I don't I don't love the horse so far, the idea of a horse in this game. Gr like granted the map is big. And yet, there are a lot of travel points and, um, you know, movement skills that various classes have to get around fast. And it's it's just a little weird to be riding your horse around and just blowing by groups of enemies that really don't even engage you if you're on your horse. Because if they did, that'd be really annoying because there'd be no point to riding your horse if you get, like, knocked off your horse. But, like, I can't shake the feeling that oh, the horse might just exist to sell microtransactions <laughs> rather than be something uh, that's meaningful for the game. Because we've seen... There are a number of, of cosmetic mounts. There are a number of cosmetic ornaments you can put on the mounts. Um, some of these are free. Some of these are earned rewards. Some of them are not. Um, and I, mm, I don't know if the game needed the horse, but I feel like they may have wanted it as another microtransaction avenue. Um, a, another microtransaction avenue will be armor transmog. Uh, thankfully, this is not Destiny. And any look you get, any item, any legendary, whatever, if you salvage it, it will be added to your uh, collection. So really, you, if you want to keep one, you know, keep your good one, you'll have to salvage a bad one in order to get that look. And like, even with just the campaign legendaries and campaign rare gear that I found, I was able to make some really cool looks 
for my Necromancer. I love the character creator system. I've said this since the beta. I love the detail that you can put into your heroes. The, the armor work they've done here is fantastic. Really excellent stuff, like just miles and miles beyond what we've seen from the series before. I like that you get this big view of your character right when it starts up. Uh, which, you know, <laughs> it's like, it's a little thing, but like it, it makes you know, the fashion and whatever and the, the character design seem pretty cool. Uh, it is easy to say that this is going to be a very, very time consuming uh, entry going forward. I think both fans of Diablo 2 and Diablo 3 are going to like this for different reasons. In many ways, it does feel like a return to, I guess, sort of the vibes of Diablo 2. Uh, while retaining a lot of the accessibility of Diablo 3, while adding in a bunch of stuff like Path of Exile's complexity and Lost Ark's exploration. Um, the innovation here does seem a little like they've pulled from these other games rather than making up too much stuff themselves. If I had a complaint, it would, it would be like maybe this whole thing feels like it's playing it just a little, a little bit safe, but like, you know, that's not the end of the world. Like, for as much as people like Diablo 2 and 3... Don't broke what ain't, no, don't fix what ain't broke. <laughs> that, you know, comes to mind. So I get why they wouldn't want to stray like too, too far. And the stuff they have changed, like the open world and things like that, I think that's certainly a good addition. So there's going to be a lot more to say about this. I, I said yesterday, like, I have to essentially shelve all my other games except Destiny and Diablo for the foreseeable future. Like, I got to put Zelda down. I, I don't have another spare 100 hours to, like, beat Zelda right now. So. Uh, I will be covering these going forward. Obviously, Diablo made enough of an impression on me to want to play more of it. This is not Redfall, where I quit after four hours, obviously. Um, and I think people will be satisfied with this, so long as servers don't melt down and people can actually play. Um, if you enjoyed the beta and if you thought they were moving in a good direction, I think you will like where you end up at the end of the campaign, at the beginning of the end game. And I will have uh, kind of more... Um, persistent thoughts as time goes on. I have to redo the whole campaign now on Barbarian. Um, I don't I don't think that really gives you an advantage necessarily, like knowing what happens. It, it doesn't. It's just, it's going to take just as long anyway. And I think it's going to be a lot harder on Barbarian because I have to tank everything myself instead of having my million skeletons tank it for me. And I can easily see how some of those bosses are going to be very, very hard with a melee class. <laughs> so I guess we'll see how it goes. But uh, I am happy to say that I think this is a good game. And if they can avoid massive technical issues, if they don't pull any shenanigans with microtransactions, which they don't feel like they are, uh, I, I think this is going to be a big win for them, a big win for Diablo fans. And yeah, so much more to discuss, but I wanted to get in at least uh, an initial video kind of review out there alongside um, my written review. I may or may not be playing footage as I'm talking here. I, there's some sort of time limit on footage you can show, even from like the early hours of the game. I don't know. I don't really want to deal with that. So more footage when the full, full, full spoiler embargo drops on June 2nd, I think. So it's a weird stipulation, but whatever. But anyway, we'll be talking a lot more about it. Um, if you want to get early access, sure. I do imagine there's going to be some server issues at launch here, even with their server slams in preparation. It's just a very big game. So it launches Thursday night. Seems like it's Probably not going to be playable till Friday at best is my guess um, since it's launching at like 10 p.m. here. So I will be amazed if I get to play before I go to bed that night. But um, yeah, so thanks for watching. And uh, I guess I will be splitting into a Destiny slash Diablo channel for the foreseeable future. So thanks a lot. I will talk to you soon. Take care.